Regional Center for Rural Development, and I'm your moderator for today's session. We have Catherine Drager and Rich Pirag on, who are our presenters, and I think I'm going to introduce Rich, and then he'll take it from there. Uh, Rich is here with our um, MSU Center for Regional Food Systems, uh, providing leadership uh, for um, developing regionally integrated sustainable regional food system. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Rich. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, we uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, partner with uh, NCRCRD on this particular webinar presentation today. Uh, as uh, Scott uh, said, our center is, uh, is a recent center uh, that's been formed at uh, Michigan State University. Uh, we work on a number of issues around regional foods. Uh, we were formerly the CS, um, the CS uh, Mott Group at Michigan State University. Uh, among the things we work on are the Michigan Good Food Charter, food access and health farm institutions. Uh, we have a Michigan Food Hub Network. Uh, and We also do some work in um, food systems planning and organic production. And uh, our uh, website is, is there as well. And uh, I had the uh, distinct um, uh, privilege of, of getting to know Kathy Drager, who's our uh, primary uh, presenter today when I was at Iowa State University uh, at the Leopold Center uh, for uh, a number of years. And Kathy, uh, the topic that Kathy's going to be uh, speaking about today is something that's uh, both of, uh, uh, of interest and um, uh, a, a lot of uh, attention as we look at uh, issues around food and rural uh, development across the Midwest. And so both uh, Scott's center and our center um, hold an interest in, in this particular topic. Kathy is the statewide director of the University of Minnesota Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships, which is a program of University of Minnesota Extension. Kathy comes to this position having founded and run two successful environmentally based businesses, Environmental Ground Inc. and Sustainability International Inc., the latter of which was bought out by an engineering firm. Uh, Kathy holds a doctorate in water resources with her dissertation focusing on lo local watershed management in Minnesota. She's the recipient of a Bush Leadership Fellowship and was a MacArthur Scholar at the University of Minnesota. And um, uh, Kathy is also uh, the Minnesota lead on a joint research project with the Rural Grocery Initiative, which is out of Kansas State University, and I'm sure Kathy's going to talk about that. She served on the Minnesota Grocery Access Task Force and is currently on the Minnesota Food Charter Steering Committee. And in addition, on a personal note, Kathy um, uh, and her family live on a farm and buy groceries in rural Big Stone County, Minnesota, which according to uh, USDA, when they use the term food desert, is a designated food desert uh, area. So uh, on behalf of uh, our two centers, uh, we'd like to welcome uh, Kathy Drager and her presentation uh, this afternoon. Great. Uh, thank you, Rich. Thank you, Scott. Um, am I coming through clearly? Hello? Yes, great. Oh, OK. I just want to make sure that uh, I wasn't speaking into the ether. Uh, First off, thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, it's a noon hour here in Minnesota and early afternoon uh, for our friends farther east. I'm going to start today uh, by saying that I'm just so pleased to be able to uh, present some of this information. I um, as a telling Scott and Rich, I appreciate that uh, some intellectual curiosity can turn into an opportunity uh, to share this work with all of you. I'm going to take just a couple seconds to tell you about the work that I do at the University of Minnesota. So I run a program called the Regional Sustainable Development Partnership uh, together with a group of very active citizens from around greater Minnesota, which is the rural part of our state, along with staff people in five regions of the state whose job is to build community university partnerships. Um, today I am going to be talking uh, about wholesale grocers and how they fit into our food distribution system. I hope that by the end of this presentation that there will be three things. 
that you will have had an opportunity to discover this story because frankly at this point in time it really is a story of how food is distributed to our rural areas and I'm going to be giving you an example from a, the rural food desert. Secondly that you'll have a chance to uh, connect that there is all kinds of opportunities for us to connect with the existing distribution system and that can aid our work for those of us who work in the area of sustainable healthy and local foods and third I have to admit that though I'm coming at this from an academic point of view that there is a degree of advocacy in what we will be talking about today number one I have become a huge fan of rural grocery stores and so I hope all of you will consider attending the National Rural Grocery Summit that will be held at Manhattan, Kansas at K-State uh, June 9th through 10th. Um, and just so you know, we're going to have one heck of a fun busload of people uh, leaving from someplace in mid-Minnesota and driving through Iowa and picking up folks along the way. Uh, so if you happen to be on our, our bus route, uh, you'll be welcome to, to join us on our trip down to Kansas State. My interest in wholesale groceries, uh, in addition to being personal because I buy groceries in a rural food desert, is also a, a very large part of the work of the regional partnerships. Uh, we were formed by the legislature and our um, Minnesota legislature back in the late 1990s and really given the mission to work on issues of sustainable agriculture in addition to natural resources, uh, sustainable tourism, and clean energy. So this is really a, an outgrowth of our uh, sustainable agriculture and local foods work. Uh, for more than a dozen years we've been building these community university connections, really listening to what are the issues faced at the community level and what university resources we can bear to um, help further those along. And one of our efforts was Farm to School that uh, started out as a community project with a specific school more than a dozen years ago and has grown into um, more of an established program with a statewide leadership team that includes universities, funders, and state agencies. So we were pleased to be able to seed some of that work. And what we've seen is that we're, this program, the Regional Partnerships, is kind of investigating some of those early murmurings of, hey, this could be important, and what can we do to further it? And I believe this work that I'll be presenting today is an example of that. It was about probably a year and a half ago, a year ago or so, that I uh, was driving back from having toured a wholesale produce distributor in Wadena, Minnesota, and I was having a conversation with Chuck Weibel. Uh, Chuck Weibel, who I am sorry to say has since passed away, was a visionary in deep winter greenhouses and how we produce greens. Uh, in a distributed manner in our cold climates and he was really interested in how are we going to aggregate and distribute this so I was having an excited conversation with him um, having come out of a wholesale produce and saying okay Chuck we've got some connections to do we've since gone on to really start building a research agenda around deep winter greenhouses working with a variety of community people and folks from across the university in the College of Design, in the horticulture, um, looking at economic aspects. Um, but one of those issues is really how are we going to um, build and, and enter into the food distribution system. So I'm going to start by giving you a couple examples of some of the people I've had the privilege to talk to over the past uh, couple of years about wholesale groceries. I want to thank a few people. First off, I'd like to thank Merlin Krakow, who is with Mason Brothers in Wadena, Minnesota. He gave me a first-hand crash course. This was as good as any college class I've ever had uh, by giving multiple tours of his facility in Wadena, Minnesota, and even helping me test putting things on his distribution truck to see how they would get to rural places. This was someone who was really willing to experiment with us on, hey, you've got a distribution system. We have a need. If we put this on a truck there, will it make it there? 
Uh, so thank you to Merlin. I want to thank um, Doug Cunningham with Affiliated Foods Midwest, who also helped to give me some instruction and some idea about his wholesale grocer, which serves over 800 grocery stores uh, throughout a, I believe, about the same region as uh, the NCRCRD, which is about a 12-state region. Um, and then finally, I want to talk some about Russ Davis, who just focuses on produce. So I'll just start with Affiliated Food. They are actually a wholesale grocer that is a co-op. They are member owned by the more than 800 stores that take part in this. They have distribution centers in Norfolk, Nebraska, Elwood, Kansas, and Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, that's where their trucking and their warehouse facilities in addition to other places are located. Um, so how these wholesale grocers work is uh, these are the places, these are the warehouses where all your dry goods, produce, meat, bakery, frozen, and even some of your sin uh, things, maybe some alcohol, cigarettes, you know, certainly um, all of those products that you see in a grocery store are located. So that those 800 stores, in the case of affiliated foods, they order on a probably a, at least twice a week and have trucks that fill up at this warehouse and then are delivered to these stores uh, on a weekly, often twice a week, or even more basis. So in a nutshell, that's what these wholesale grocers are. They're these massive warehouses of every kind of food that's going to be stocked on your grocery shelf. Because uh, those small town grocers, and I'm really going to focus on the small town grocers, they're the ones who really need to have access to that whole depth and breadth of groceries uh, that are needed to stock the shelves. So affiliated, so their business model is as a co-op and they're approximately 100 years old. And as I said, they serve 800 grocery stores in our region. Now, in addition to serving food and getting those groceries stocked on the shelves, There is a number of other retail services that these uh, affiliated in particular uh, helps with. For example, if you're buying a new store and you need some help figuring out how much it's going to cost you to stock those shelves, these are the folks who can help you with that. Budgeting and forecasting, um, food safety, sanitation. The list of services that are on this list, almost all of those are provided free by affiliated uh, to their members and people who would be interested in members. So that's an important aspect that I had not realized before, but there is a lot involved with running a grocery store. And uh, some of these grocery store wholesalers really have a lot of expertise on staff that can help a grocery store keep their doors open, keep the regulations um, met, um, and they can help with any number of the actual business um, aspects, your profit and loss reviews, your payroll analysis. Um, and so that's another important thing. So in addition to keeping the shelves stocked. So having given you just a little bit of background on what a wholesale grocer does, I want to take you on a trip from starting with your grocery list in a small town. In this case, it's in Minnesota. It's in a designated rural food desert. And how are these people actually going to uh, be able to fill their grocery cart? And how does the wholesale grocer fit into that? Uh, for everyday items such as milk or specialty items such as an organic produce and even our locally grown and produced items. This takes me directly to Mason Brothers. Mason Brother Wholesale Grocers, which are the people who are delivering the groceries uh, to this small town. And uh, Mason Brothers, as I said, uh, they provide a number of services to the grocery store. And what you're looking at on your screen right now is a um, circular. So this is a flyer that Mason Brothers puts together that 
shows all the foods that are on sale for a given week. This is uh, can range from about a four page circular to about a 10 page circular. And they create this for every grocery store that can afford to, to buy it. And, um, and it shows the, the sales. Now, if you'll see on the bottom left hand, it says Bonnie's hometown. And in little teeny tiny writing, too small to see, it says uh, provided by Mason Brothers, which this was my first clue that I wanted to track back where these groceries came from. And so I checked with Mason Brothers. Um, this circular is really valuable. This is really valuable to a small town. And I want to uh, just pause and say Bonnie's Hometown Grocery, which is the store we're going to focus on for a few minutes, is one of the smallest communities in Minnesota that still has a full uh, product grocery store. The town has a population of 400 and they are, they are able to support a grocery store that's open seven days a week. Um, this circular provides people in the community the opportunity to buy food at a price that is equal to or below some of the big box stores. A lot of people think that you automatically have to pay more for shopping in a small town grocery store. If people shop off the circular, which usually provides a cross-section of food from produce to meat to bakery to dry goods, canned goods, frozen goods, uh, you can actually stock your uh, grocery basket at a price that would be equal to uh, leaving your region to shop in a big box store, which uh, for this small town, um, it's at least 60 miles to the nearest probably big box store. So I, I have a lot of pictures of trucks because of this particular truck because I was absolutely fascinated that this truck could back up this narrow small town alley and get into the quote unquote loading dock for this grocery store. Um, I it took a lot of skill and it actually took a lot of time for them to back this truck up and believe me I've tried backing up trucks before which is probably why I was amazed to see them uh, doing this with the degree of skill. Now there's one thing I want to point out in this picture. If you look at that lower left hand side you'll see the remains of an old super value store. Um, if you're from uh, Minnesota I, or, and certainly I think super values are throughout our region. This is a major grocery chain and they are also a wholesale grocer uh, for our region. Now Anecdotally, and I don't have any confirmation of this, but what I have heard in the industry is that a store like Super Value, or actually any wholesale grocer, can make a go of it in communities of about 3,200 people and above. So this is an important kind of number to remember. Larger communities, which you know you maybe wouldn't consider 3,200, but those communities that have a population of 3,200 and above, they really have their pick of where they buy their groceries. There'll be a number of wholesale grocers willing to serve them. As you start getting uh, into smaller um, markets, smaller communities, the number of wholesale grocers who will serve your community decreases. Um, Mason Brothers is unique. They serve 260 stores in Minnesota, Western South Dakota, Western North Dakota, uh, Wisconsin, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And they have a niche of serving the smallest of the small town stores. So these are the people who are delivering to those towns of 400, 500, 600 people that may not have any other wholesalers uh, to bring in food to their town. So, um, and I want to point one other thing about Mason Brothers. You just barely see on this map of Minnesota that there's a dot where they're located out of. They are based in Wadena, Minnesota, which has a population of 400. Mason Brothers employs 260 people in this town. 
and these are considered very good jobs. I toured their facility a number of times. They have an on-site swimming pool, on-site gym. This is, and it's open to everybody of the company, from the president to the person who is, you know, picking out the bad oranges to put in the compost bin. And so they are, uh, they are serving um, these community by pri providing 260 really good jobs. Um, it's a family-owned company, so it's not a publicly traded company. Uh, but I find it interesting that at probably at least 10% of the families in that community of 400, at least 10% of the families, are benefiting from uh, employment with this company. So keep backing up that truck. And uh, I, the view, I, I put this up because these trucks, they're large and they have a number of containers. So you've got your dry goods, you've got your frozen goods, you've got your refrigerated goods, um, all different compartments in these trucks so that they can deliver the full line of groceries uh, to each individual store. What's remarkable is that this town of 400 people has twice weekly deliveries from Mason Brothers. So this is, this is really a benefit for those of you who are interested in providing fresh fruit and fresh vegetables to your community. Think about how having a twice a week delivery of those fresh items to say nothing of bakery and meats and other things. But this is really an asset to the community. Um, and I've heard this local grocer say a number of times that they're very grateful that we're able to get uh, groceries twice a week through this system. So here's the loading dock. It's basically the back door of a uh, hundred year old building on Main Street. And the delivery system is we put up a few uh, milk crates and they pull out a roller and all this work is done by hand. Um, so I, I'm feeling rather geeky about this because I was absolutely fascinated to see that the staff of this grocery store and the staff of Mason Brothers, they're actually doing a lot of hand labor and trying to be as ingenious as possible in uh, getting those groceries off the truck. We don't have a forklift. We don't have pallets. I mean, we're they're taking cases of milk and loading them by, um, by hand. So here we are still unloading groceries. Now, here's a tray of bakery items that slid off the truck on those rollers and into the store. Now, one of the things that's unique about Mason Brothers, and, and in fact, it's probably not unique to Mason Brothers. I'm, I'm probably certain that every grocery wholesaler has a similar um, system. Mason Brothers has a bakery and they respond to small town grocers who don't have bakeries. A lot of the bakeries have gone from a lot of small towns. But for example, if you're having a birthday party and you want a cake that says, happy birthday, David, you can call up your grocer in Maine, in, in Clinton, Minnesota, and say, I want this cake with these words on it. And within two days, it will come down that roller into uh, the grocery store. So they have a customized bakery to order um, that is providing baked goods by demand uh, to the community, whether that's, um, you know, breads, cakes, cookies, donuts. Uh, they make the absolute best ciabattas um, that I've, I've had. So really a whole bakery that is available to them. One other thing that Mason Brothers does, and again, I'm sure that, you know, Affiliated and other uh, Super Value and other wholesale grocers do, is they also, inside their warehouse, have a USDA inspected meat facility. Um, as some of you know who are in rural places, there is really a shortage of probably USDA or state equal to inspected facilities. Um, Mason Brothers has this so that these stores can order cuts of meat and they can be packaged, they can be tailor-made, ground beef, prime rib, um, you know, pork, whatever the meat is, and they can be packaged and um, by order gone to the grocery store. Now this particular store actually orders larger pieces of 
of meat and they actually do the grinding and you know for making hamburger and the the cuts for steak and stew meat on site uh, so that capacity still rests in this small town store but uh, it's very nice to be able to get the USDA inspected meat uh, through the wholesaler. Christy had a question about uh, Russ Davis Wholesale that yep. sells to Mason Brothers. So that's great. I'm getting to produce. Uh, produce is just going to be a couple slides down. I thought I'd cover bakery and meat and I'm going to just talk a little bit about the community service too that we have uh, from our okay. local grocery stores and as part of this system as well. And then we'll get right into, and I do have some of those examples from where Russ Davis gets their produce. So I'm, I'm glad I kind of anticipated some of your questions and interests. So uh, this is a picture, again, at the back of Bonnie's hometown on Main Street, uh, Clinton. And what you see behind, this is the president of our farmers union for the area. Uh, but right behind him on the right are, is a big pallet of food. So this is food that's destined for the food shelf. So Bonnie's will, you know, really passes on some of her wholesale prices to make sure that our food shelf is stocked as well. And uh, so, and in return, the food shelf preferentially when they can and need to, uh, which, is, which is regularly, purchases their food through the grocery store. Now the benefit to this is that the more a grocery store sells, the lower the prices are. That's the whole Walmart principle, right? So if we can keep the groceries flowing through the grocery store and then to the food shelf and to the schools and other places, that gives us an opportunity to actually increase the access to food, lowering prices and making it available uh, to the entire community. So uh, I think where we can and we have done some farm to school surveys and we find that a number of schools actually are using their local grocery stores i encourage if there are other food bank folks that are listening where you can set up this relationship with your local grocery store this actually helps to uh to keep that food uh, accessible for a number of community members and so now i will get to christy's question which is uh, how are we getting fresh produce into these stores? So Mason Brothers does buy some fresh produce directly. Um, so they will have, you know, directly buy from uh, a grower some potatoes or other items. But oftentimes uh, they are buying from Russ Davis um, wholesale uh, produce. Now Russ Davis originally started in Wadena, Minnesota as well. It's probably not a coincidence that you have a wholesale grocer uh, right next to a wholesale produce provider. Um, and Russ Davis is one of the premier uh, providers of fresh fruit and vegetables for our area. And what, what Mason Brothers will do then is they can also put in their produce order through Russ Davis. Now, this particular grocery store is too small to be able to purchase produce off of a Russ Davis truck. Russ Davis will provide directly, and they work directly with many grocery stores throughout the region, thousands, to provide produce. However, the smallest of small stores do not merit a stop by a large produce truck, which is why it's important that wholesale grocers can have access to these fresh fruits and vegetables. And so 100% of the produce that you see on this actual produce shelf um, was provided by um, Mason Brothers. Probably much of it came through Russ Davis, but it's all on the Mason Brothers truck. So, I'm going to give you a little tour of Russ Davis because if any of you are foodies out there, if you like like fresh fruit and vegetables and just an array of interesting and delicious uh, fresh produce, this place is astounding. Uh, again, it's located in Wadena, Minnesota, which I see someone looked up the population. It's 4,100 people. Um, and this is basically the service area that they uh, made with uh, 
cherry tomatoes and blueberries and grapes of of their service so that would be north dakota south dakota minnesota wisconsin and iowa and so this is just an example of one of the produce wholesalers uh, in the country again this is a private not publicly traded company okay this is kind of a small but i i wanted to just kind of show you some of the variety of fruits and vegetables that are coming through Russ Davis. Now these are uh, cucumbers, cases of cucumbers that came from Honduras. So Russ Davis prides themselves that what distinguishes them in the marketplace is that they have high quality produce. And that's really kind of the value that they hold. I will say that walking in and touring their facility, they have the Minnesota grown signs up and they do believe in, you know, connecting with the local growers when possible, but they still say we need to maintain our quality. People call us because they know our produce is good. And it was abundant and it was varieties. I, you know, like the quantity of mushrooms, and these are all things that are moving off the shelf on a really regular basis, uh, was really astounding. So the question came to where Russ Davis gets their food, and, and I was uh, taken with the celery roots from Melissa's, and so I had the same question that Christy asked earlier, which is where does Russ Davis get their food? Well, they get it from every corner of the planet. Uh, so these particular celery root, they came through Melissa's, which is a produce company out of California. Um, and so this, again, was kind of a mom and pop shop. It started out, they said, with one office, three phones, four chairs. And now they are the largest distributor of specialty products in the United States. Uh, and those products are making their way into Wadena, Minnesota, which is... Uh, uh, and in you know a wholesale hub that then distributes these uh, vegetables out through thousands of stores in the Midwest and there was a wide variety of gorgeous and interesting organically grown conventionally grown uh, fruits vegetables these are some orange uh, beets with the green still on um, this was an interesting one of those test cases. This lettuce, this artisan lettuce that you see, was just absolutely appealing. And my question is, I want that. Can I ask my grocer in a town of 400 people to get me that lettuce? And can it show up in the store? And uh, the answer was yes. And so this is what I was saying about just being able to test what can make it through this distribution channel. And there's a fair amount of flexibility uh, that if you can work with your local grocer, you can request and get these things on the shelf. Now I will say from the grocer's point of view, some of that depends and it's very dependent on the quantity at which it has to be purchased in. Um, if some of these things have to be purchased in large cases, the grocery store owner may not be able to buy them because it will rot before enough sales are done to uh, distribute that food. And so part of the advocacy that I, I said I wanted to get across in this uh, talk was what you buy creates the demand and it stocks the shelf in these small rural stores. So if you're willing to buy and uh, kale on a regular basis, it'll show up on your produce case. Um, the problem is if you are only interested in kale every three months, then um, if you're in a small enough town, it simply won't move and the grocer will not be able to request that product. Uh, there was a number of, these were some organic herbs that were offered, um, cases of organic carrots, uh, as well as these gigantic, uh, you know, containers of conventionally grown uh, fruits. Um, I want to thank Scott Carr, who is the gentleman on the uh, left-hand side of the screen, who spent quite a bit of time with me. He always answers my calls, and he is one of the uh, managers of Russ Davis in Wadena, Minnesota. So, again, I appreciate the education that I, the generous education I was given by many of these folks. 
So getting back to my point about um, how the supply chain works, again, this is a picture uh, of the inside of the warehouse of Russ Davis. And so uh, Dale's Grocery Store in Warren, Minnesota, and I believe Warren has a population of about 1,500 people. They put in an order for cut fresh fruit and it's able to go through Mason Brothers. Uh, they have a brand called Crazy Fresh. And so Dale's Food in Warren, Minnesota can place specialty orders and they can get those fresh fruits and vegetables on demand as, you know, with some specifications um, to go to a small town store. So again, kind of getting back to that supply chain issue, uh, this is a really flexible and um, helps to increase that access to these fresh fruits and vegetables. Here was a, a set of cases of absolutely gorgeous green beans. This was a product of the United States. Um, and it was about this time of year that I took this picture. It was last year. And um, here is one of the ways that Russ Davis distributes these. So obviously we're not gonna be sending out this is not what you see in the grocery store and some of these beans will be sold bulk but they also have a brand called Crazy Fresh uh, where they package up these uh, fruits and vegetables and are uh, selling these um, in this size for uh, small town groceries and we get a number of the Crazy Fresh products into um, even into Clinton, Minnesota uh, they have grill mixes, uh, all sorts of fresh fruits and vegetables, salsas, um, and this is a brand that they take and they do the processing and packaging of. And um, many of you noticed it's on the uh, asparagus is currently one of the seasonal vegetables that is absolutely hitting the market and we're seeing it everywhere. So there is a degree of seasonality uh, to this as well. And I think those of you who have gone grocery shopping lately will have noticed that in fact asparagus is one of them that's hitting. So again I came at this work because I was interested in local foods. What are our supply chains for local foods? How do we get them? What can we learn and how can we connect with these wholesale grocers in order to connect with our local food system? How are we helping our small, mid-sized, and other farmers have access? So I said, show me what we got for local. Now, it was like February in Minnesota. So you'll have to keep that in mind as you look at these next slides. So they took me to the potato section. So potatoes are one of those items that are uh, locally grown. There's a number of potato producers in the um, Red River Valley and they are entering the wholesale market. So uh, that's that's one of the crops that we're seeing. These are from the Red River Valley. These are two different brands from two different uh, farm families. Another item that was grown in Minnesota and produced and in the Russ Davis distribution system were uh, turnips which are a good story in root crop. And I did ask specifically, I'm like, wow, that's like a really antique looking bag. And he said, yeah, because that's the demographic for turnips is they like these really kind of 1950 style uh, packaging. Uh, so turnips were another one that was locally grown and worked well in the wholesale uh, produce system. This one, sorry, the, I'm afraid this slide turned out kind of small, but these are sunflower seeds. Again, uh, they were distributed through uh, Winmouth Farms and through New Hope, Minnesota. So seeds, those are another, you know, nuts, those are another thing that can fit well into the, um, into the wholesale system. So those of you who are interested in um, composting, I was awed by this is this was the compost bin and uh, that is some pretty darn good looking produce that made it into the produce bin so I think those of us who work in the food system recognize that food waste is one of those things we just have to deal with but Russ Davis considers quality their number one 
you know, why people pick them. And so they, they do have high standards for their produce. And so um, a fair amount ended up in the compost bin. So I'm just putting that on somebody else's to-do list. If you want to help, uh, let's work through that food waste issue, which I know is a huge one. Now, here is one of the things that really got me thinking. Here is garlic. And it might, print might be too small, but this garlic is a, pro, a product of China. Now, garlic seems to me like one of those absolutely uh, items that we should be able to work out the supply chain and, and meet our market, uh, especially in this part of the world. We have the Minnesota Garlic Festival and a, a number of garlic growers. However, one of the things that was surprising to me is that they're, how specific the garlic market is in that they size them down to the half centimeter. In other words, you could pick if, you know, toggle, is this a 50 to 55 millimeter garlic bulb or a 55 to 60 millimeter garlic bulb? And so that kind of gets to the crux of why it's hard for us to get local foods just it's not a turnkey operation to go from farm to wholesale uh, produce company because the product specifications can be so specific and they're looking for such uniformity that it's really hard unless you have some other level of aggregation distribution. And I know a number of you are interested in food hubs. So this might really be when we're looking at our local food system, maybe that's part of what our food hub purpose is for our local growers, is to help us to meet some of these um, specifications that are currently at play in the wholesale produce uh, market. Now, my question, and I've asked this question before, is who's setting these standards? I mean, I... I like garlic and I'm not noticing if I'm buying a 55 millimeter bulb or a 58 millimeter bulb. So, so is this a consumer driven thing or a grocer driven thing or just some kind of standard that was developed, uh, you know, for grading garlic. But my, my question would be, do we have some opportunities to enter this market with a degree of variability in our products, which is what we see uh, when we are working with local foods. And so I want to talk too about how local foods are making it onto the grocery shelf. And quite often we just have to bypass the wholesale distribution system. And I see we've got a couple questions on here about does the consignment model actually work? In other words, if a farmer brings his good into the store and sells it on consignment, is that actually a model that can work? Um, and I, I can give you anecdotal experience. I think that it's probably an area that's really ripe for some research. Um, but anecdotally, yes. Uh, here's an example. You may not be able to see the sign. It says homegrown popcorn, $13.99 each or two for $20. And so that's this is an example of direct farm to store. So this farmer developed a relationship with the grocery store owner and so they were able to say I'm growing popcorn will you sell it and the grocery store owner said sure and so uh, this is homegrown popcorn that's for sale this did not go into the distribution system frankly I don't think it could go into the distribution system because there's no way this farmers producing enough to sell to 800 stores Furthermore, the way the wholesale system works is that that product needs to be requested by the stores. Um, when you put your order in to your grocery store order or owner buying your groceries, you you have to specify what products you want, um, and so those grocers need to be aware of your product so that they can request it. But this is a good example of how this farmer was moving his popcorn. Uh, by building a relationship with the grocery store and selling it on the store. And this was a consignment model. So this grocery, the grocer did not buy this popcorn outright. They paid the farmer for all the, all the popcorn that was sold. And so that is what I mean by a consignment model. That's a farmer's market in the store. Uh, this is an opportunity for the farmer to sell, put his item on the short store shelf so it's for sale at a retail level to those consumers seven days a week. 
and um, as his popcorn sells, he's compensated for the, the bags of popcorn he sells. Um, but I think that especially in these small town stores where the margin is so close that the farmer has to share the risk with the grocer. We've got to have farmers who are willing to um, take the economic risk of selling that product. It can't all fall on the grocer's shelves because that is a really a disincentive. Um, but I think it works well. Now the question was asked, do I know what the markup is on that popcorn? And generally speaking, you negotiate that with the grocer. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there was no markup on this popcorn um, or very little, you know, 50 cents or, or a set amount. But I suspect it's a very low markup. I know, for example, in the case of eggs, that the markup is uh, 25 cents, which brings the uh, local organic eggs from $3.75 a dozen to an even $4 a dozen. And so it's just a set price. And um, but you need to develop a relationship with the grocer and that's easier for some people than for others um, because you also need to demonstrate that you're willing to be a partner and you're committed to the success of your local grocery store as well because um, I will say you know having been a foodie and a member of a co-op and an organic producer ourselves that sometimes I don't want to buy the food that's on the shelf of the rural grocery um, but I try to make the healthiest choices and I try to buy 100% of my staples uh, from a small town grocer and I have found that that grocer has been uh, very accommodating in terms of, of what we look for and not just me but other community members look for in their grocery basket. We have a couple families that have children and, and adults that need gluten-free diets and now we have a gluten-free section of the grocery store. You have some other families that are really committed to only eating organic food and now we have organic uh, produce and milk uh, on the shelves and so it's really a matter of communicating with your grocer and then also providing the market. If you ask your grocer to put something on the shelves that only you buy, you really have to think that you have a commitment to buy it. Um, you know, I'll give an example like something like Nutella, which maybe um, wouldn't be something that would go over or well known in the town. But if you're going to ask your grocer to buy it and she can only buy it in a case of 24, that you do, you know, need to be aware that that grocer might be at risk by making that purchase and so again it gets back to that advocacy and that participation in the food system in a way that is is kind of communal really so um, because many locally grown products will not be in the quantities that are needed for wholesale distribution I think we need to work directly continue to work directly with the grocery store owners I think this idea of the uh, farmers market within the store is a really excellent idea and that is how a lot of you know a, a substantial amount of fresh produce makes it into this grocery store is by growers who bring it in and sell it directly in the store that requires that you build that relationship that the farmer share the risk with the store owner by using that consignment model and also we need to have some customer loyalty to these uh, small town stores and so in conclusion, uh, here's the, at the end of the day, here's what the grocery store basket looked like. You know, we got one of those crazy fresh uh, vegetables and some organic milk and some fresh fruit and some locally grown popcorn, um, as well as other items that uh, make for um, a, a healthy and accessible food system. Uh, in the smallest of small towns in what would otherwise be considered a food desert. And so I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Did you notice the question about the internet sales? I did not. So the question, has internet sales had an effect on these stores? Um, 
I suspect there might be some. I mean, I, I will say I do that myself. There's some teas that I can't get at my local grocery store, and so I have bought bought those online. Um, but I think overall, probably not uh, significantly, especially if we're looking at fresh produce or meat or dairy, uh, some of those items. And I think the bulkiness of other items, chips or canned goods, um, really makes grocery stores a unique and enduring part of Main Street. Um, your question is actually a pretty good question because we have lost a lot of stores on Main Street. Those of you in rural areas, uh, you just drive down, get off the beaten path, drive down some of those Main Streets. We don't have a lot of businesses remaining. Grocery stores are one of those core anchor businesses that still remain on many of the smallest of Main Streets. Um, and again, getting back to this advocacy, please, those of you who maybe live in regional centers or in large metro areas, as you're traveling with your work or for pleasure, take your grocery list, go into a small town grocery and buy everything you can to satisfy your grocery list off a small town grocery. You'll be doing um, a community a favor, a small business a favor, and these stores are, are really need every customer to keep the doors open. Yeah, I think it's a, it, you know it, it really is a valid question, and 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 maybe um, maybe it hasn't had much impact yet. But I think you know Doug's comment is a good one. I think the other thing that uh, uh, is starting to happen is that um, you know for a long time, uh, you know, internet was not particularly speedy in rural areas and you know everybody wants uh, faster internet so uh, you know you really can't uh, necessarily um, argue against you know providing those services to rural areas but as uh, the internet service gets better in rural areas you might find more people going that route whereas today they will you know they'll drive to the the biggest nearest large town to do their clothing shopping but still buy their groceries locally um, if the internet deliveries start to um, become more efficient it's easier to navigate around the internet with faster speed I do wonder if that's going to have a bigger impact in the future do you want to comment on that uh, I think Doug's point is well taken, and I know that before, uh, you know, seven, eight years ago, I was using internet grocery myself. You know, with three small kids, it was certainly easier to click and purchase rather than try to pack three kids into car seats and grocery shop. So you have a good point. It is convenient. Um, but Doug, just so you're aware, in Minnesota we have no sales tax on food. So that is not an advantage in Minnesota because we charge no sales tax on food items. Um, and, I, and I really have not seen any um, internet uh, competition, at least we're a very remote and rural place. Uh, on, we're right at the Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota intersection. So we actually don't have uh, as much competition. It might also be turned to the other way too where you know, your producers could use the internet to you know, see who needs whatever it is they have on hand more easily. Yes. So I, there could be some. Yep, and I was just at the Minnesota Organic Conference and did see a very good presentation by a poultry grower who is marketing his poultry uh, via the internet. And uh, so you're right, it works both ways. Producers certainly have access to a larger market by using the internet. So in fact, uh, is, it's not available. In not available in all states, but Market Maker is is um, a land grant university supported service to try to help people connect that way. So um, mm -hmm. you might uh, folks who aren't aware of that might go on and, and take a look at that. Um, Great. You want to answer so Rich's the, question? Sure. Do do I think a Mason Brothers would be interested in working with live pro stock producers uh, owned meat companies? Yes. Yeah. I think they probably would be. They do have some standards. They call their meat natural, so they do have some standards that they use, but I think it would be uh, some conversation and negotiation 
and also of course the the meat processing issue which is becoming uh, a more difficult question in Minnesota uh, just because we've just even recently lost yet another uh, meat producer that was accessible to individual farmers I mean a meat processor that was uh, doing USDA inspected meat processing for individual farmers and but your but maybe your point rich is uh, um, uh, a group of growers okay. A good comment from Spencer about an online resource there in, in Oregon. And and I'll um. Right there's. I'll paste in the the market maker link so right. people can see that. And then uh, J S asked if there's a similar effort taking uh, place in the southeast southeast uh, United States. J S, um, I think, yeah. So I am. Pretty certain that Southeast United States would have independent wholesale grocers, uh, just as we have in uh, this upper Midwest area. Uh, I think it's sometimes it's a matter of walk. Uh, the way I stumbled upon this area is I walked into my grocery store and, you know, really say, okay, where did how did these groceries come to be on the shelf? And and sometimes that's what it takes to find out who the independent wholesale grocers are because they're not advertising to the general public. They're advertising to the grocery stores. Um, you know, Mason Brothers has 260 stores. So like the 260 people in the world who they're marketing to are those grocery store owners. So there, it's a group of industries that's not really well known to the local public. Um, and from what I'm seeing, the best way to figure it out is to walk into your grocery store and find out um, who their wholesale grocer is. I know uh, I'm pleased that Doug Cunningham from Affiliated Foods is on, on this webinar. And for example, they service uh, Lamberton, Minnesota. I know for certain, but you know, you find that out by walking into the grocery store and, and asking. So Anne has a question. Anne, do grocery stores have contractual obligations um, such as minimums or percentages to wholesale grocers that limit flexibility in purchasing locally? I've heard that before, um, but I have not encountered that as an actual barrier. Um, you know, I've heard other people say that because of the seasonality, for example, of produce in Minnesota that, you know, they can't, you know, just buy apples from Minnesota because they'll lose their apple contract for the winter. I have not seen that to be the case. Um, it may be the case if you get to larger grocery stores or perhaps certainly chain grocery stores, but the group of grocery stores we were talking about today were really independent owned grocery stores that purchase their groceries through these independent wholesalers. Now, now these are grocery stores in the thousands, right? Because just between Affiliated and Mason Brothers, that's over a thousand grocery stores right there. Um, but no, I have not heard, at least in this set of grocers, that buying locally um, violates any contractual agreements that they have with a wholesale grocer. Um, so I put up a little evaluation, and so maybe po folks could look through that and click through it as uh, Kathy answers more questions. Right. So there's a question from the Oregon Spencer at the Oregon Food Bank. If you've heard of food banks using their existing infrastructure to help rural grocery uh, help rural grocers with the distribution minimum purchase challenge. Um, I've seen that the food shelf works with the local grocery store to um, increase those sales. So I think it's a very good model. I think it's an excellent model. I don't know if it's been communicated as specifically as you're talking about, Spencer. It might be a really good opportunity to get a one-two punch with your food shelf dollars by uh, working out that arrangement with a local grocer. Because they do have, um, you know, the more you buy, the lower your stocking percentage is. 
Uh, in other words, they're charged a little bit lower overhead the more volume they bring in. So again, you're really helping create more affordable access for the entire community if you can uh, do that through a uh, independent rural, you know, in our case, rural grocery store. I think that would be a very good strategy. I want to make one quick plea before everybody goes. I did have a, a slide up here. Let's see if I can, um, I know we have the, the poll up, but the Rural Grocery Summit. This is an excellent opportunity for all of you to uh, come and take part of this Rural Grocery Summit. This is a fantastic national summit that really brings a lot of these issues to the forefront. Um, I met folks from Affiliated Foods there. Uh, we're going to have some breakout sessions on local foods, facts and myths about getting them stocked on your, your shelves. Go to your local grocery store. Grocers get to go to this for free. No registration. And we will be having a bus. Uh, leaving from someplace in central Minnesota and weaving our way down through Iowa and off to Kansas. Uh, so please, if you would like to get on our bus, go ahead and contact me. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing any of you who are available at the Rural Grocery Summit in Manhattan, Kansas on July 9th and 10th. And we have a very exciting project looking at improving the nutritional environment of grocery stores. That's our AFRI, USDA AFRI grant. We're working with the Rural Grocery Initiative and Affiliated Foods to improve the uh, nutritional environment and the uh, nutritional quality and consumers ability to pick the most nutritious foods off the shelf. Um, and we started that project probably in the next coming days and it'll be a three-year project. So stay tuned as we uh, look at the role of uh, at least our small part is looking at local foods and how they contribute well, I wanna, to the food. I want to echo the thanks that uh, many of the participants have already put into the chat box there. It's an excellent presentation, a great case study, very inspirational for folks that are really trying to make those rural grocery stores stay alive in an era where there's a lot of pressure. So uh, kudos. Well, thank you for the opportunity to share my, my pictures and All right.